Good afternoon, everyone. How is everybody? It's good to see you guys again. It's been a while. I'm Grace, uh, Head of Investor Relations of Capital Land Limited. Today marks another milestone for Capital Land since we announced or since we started our strategic transformation in 2019. Uh, I'm sure all of you and including our viewers online are very excited to hear what uh, we have for you. And uh, I hope you have the whole afternoon because our group CEO has prepared one of his longest presentations since <laughs> helming Capital Land. Um, Chi Kun will share about the rationale of this uh, restructuring uh, with, with this, you know, the news this morning. We hope to uh, move faster, sharpen our focus, and our group CFO will also um, take over and join him to talk about this new entity that we are creating. So with that, sit tight. I'll invite our group CEO, uh, Mr. Lee Chikun, kun to take the mic. Hi, uh, afternoon. Thank you for making time, uh, despite the very short notice. I hope you had some time to digest the materials that we had uh, circulated uh, uh, this morning. Uh, I'll take the time to run through uh, some of the details and hopefully give some clarifications as well. So... Today is the 22nd of March. I uh, was reminded by my colleagues exactly two years ago. This was the same day when we dispatched out the circular to get uh, essentially to all our shareholders to get them to approve the merger between the Sanders Singh Bridge and Capital Land. So thank you for coming again. Uh, this is uh, a transaction today marks another important milestone of our transformation journey. Um, the last, uh, uh, ever since the merger with Ascender Singh Bridge, I think what we have done is uh, we have uh, articulated a very clear strategy of what we wanted to be. We wanted to be a globally competitive uh, real estate developer and uh, asset manager. And uh, throughout the entire uh, two years, I mean, you have seen us very focused in terms of our uh, execution. I mentioned a um, number of times before, our business model was a very simple one where uh, it's all around, uh, revolves around this concept of value, how we find value, how we add value, how we unlock value. And we stayed very disciplined in the way we, uh, in terms of our capital management, and very, very disciplined in the way we execute our strategies. Um, I, I, I mean, I think all of you are familiar in terms of the various things that we have done, whether it's on the, the REITs, on the fund side, and also on the development side. Uh, I think the team has worked extremely hard to deliver uh, on, the, on the businesses and the outcomes. So today, um, actually, we, the restructuring actually involves the creation, or rather the, the restructuring involves uh, uh, putting capital into two distinct entities. One is known as uh, Capital and Investment Management, one will be known as the Capital Land Development. Capital Land Investment Management will be listed. It is an entity that's going to be focusing on AUM growth, it's asset light, capital efficient, focusing on driving, driving fee income. The development side will be taken private by CLA, that, that is a parent holding on to capital land. It will be taken private. Okay, and the reason why it is taken, we believe that it should be a private business because the, the business itself is long gestation. It requires patient capital. We believe that by organizing it in these two different ways, we'll get the right level of capital to support the growth of the two different businesses. And of course, as part of the transaction itself, we are also taking the chance to distribute 6% of the CI. CT units to all shareholders. Okay, so that's the transaction as a whole. The reason we are the reason why we are we are doing this is first and foremost it fits in terms of the longer term strategic objective. We say we wanted to be a, a developer asset manager. That doesn't change. One is going to be done in a uh, privately held entity. One is going to be done in a listed entity. Okay. The second reason 
is that it helps to sharpen the focus. Being on the listed side, we can be very, very disciplined in terms of deploying uh, capital on buying asset management platform in creation of a fee income. Otherwise, when you are seated on the listed platform, trying to do capital allocation decisions, where you have to look at a big master plan township type development, it becomes very challenging because you can be deploying capital and the returns will take a bit longer time to come through. So by having distinct uh, entities will give us that level of flexibility and being able, like I mentioned earlier, to match the right level of capital to the business objectives. Thirdly, if you look at this uh, chart here, uh, I think it's uh, in the slides that you have. If you look on the left, left hand side, traditional developer typically trades at about 0.6 to 0.8 times book. I mean, capital M for the last 10, 20 years, typically we've been trading at about 20 to 30% discount to book value. And if you look at some of the uh, investment managers, whether it is uh, Charter Hall, the Blackstone, the Brookview, or the Goodmans of the world, uh, the kind of trading multiple that they can have. I mean, it's uh, evident on the, on, the, uh, green, uh, on the green graph that you can see on the left-hand side of the chart. On the right-hand side, okay, if you look on a forward PE basis, I think it indicates the same thing. Okay, so fundamentally, we believe that okay, if we can list the investment management business separately, okay, holding on to the REITs, the private equity funds, and into the investment properties that can be recycled within a short period of time, I think that that should allow us to trade better than what we are trading today. So post the transaction, we're going to organize the business into two different entities, okay, CLIM and Capital and Development. So the Capital and Investment Management will have the fund management business, the lodging business, okay, and will include all the REIT units, the private equity funds, the REIT managers, and also investment properties, investment properties that can be recycled within the next two years and maximum three years giving it the ammunition to recycle and to provide the capital for further growth, okay, as an as a, a asset manager. It's clean. On the capital and development side, what you will have will be all the big township projects, the development, residential development projects in Singapore, the, the development projects in Vietnam, in India, and in China, at the same time, it also includes investment properties. Investment properties that it's going to take more than three years before it can be recycled. Okay, because some of the properties will take a longer time to reach the level of maturity before it can be recycled. So if you take the step back, okay, there are two different businesses. One on the right hand side, the capital and investment management business. Through this restructuring, all existing shareholders of Capital M will continue to own this part of the business. So we can continue to hopefully enjoy the growth and the upside on the, through the listing of the CLIM. At the same time, the development side of the business is the one where it will be taken private. We have negotiated with CLA to take private this business at 0 0.95 times NAV, okay? 0 0.95 times NAV. In our view, we think it's a fair price to be able to get for the business uh, because it is a development business. And the second uh, point is that it is also taking over some of the projects that is going to take longer time to reach a level of maturity for recycling. And again, the big picture, big picture, this, the part that is taken private, we negotiated 0.95 times NAV. The consideration for this part of the business, okay, it's going to be paid in cash, which is 90, for every share that you own in Capital N, you'll be paid 95 cents of cash. 
okay, and also CICT units that CLA do not wish to participate as part of the distribution exercise that we are doing out of the 6%. So if I can bring you to, the, to this chart here to give you a better explanation. So for one capital land share, okay, an existing CL shareholder will get one claim share, about 95 cents in terms of uh, cash consideration. There will be two parts of the CICT units. One part of the CICT units is the one that's distributed to all shareholders. That means everyone is entitled to it. And the other part is the consideration that CLA has decided not to participate. Okay, so the consideration for the privatization is two parts. Huh? One is the 95 cents of cash and the 17 cents of the offerer's entitlement. Okay, so that's for the taking private side of the consideration. I hope that's clear because it's quite a complex transaction. I thought I wanted to take a bit of time to, to go through these details with you. Uh, in terms of uh, the entire consideration, our view, if you take a look at this slide here, uh, assuming okay, the, CL, the CLIM trades at one time book, okay, you include the cash consideration and you include the CICT units. Okay, if you look at whether it's uh, comparing against the last close, the five-year VWAP or the 10-year VWAP, it is a good 24 to 28% upside for the capital and shareholders. Okay, there's immediate unlocking of value for existing shareholders and shareholders will also get to participate in the growth of the capital and investment management that will be separately listed by way of introduction on the Singapore Stock Exchange. So I think it is a pretty exciting transaction from our point of view. Okay, so that's the big transaction construct. And the final point that I want to highlight is that even though we're going to create two different distinct entities, one listed and one unlisted, we want to be able to preserve the ecosystem that Capital N currently enjoys so that the Capital N investment management will be able to enjoy development pipeline of assets that are stabilized and can continue to feed the growth of the AUM business, whether it's on the REITs or the private equity fund. We think this will be a unique and distinct advantage for this particular CLIM that is quite different and unique compared to most other uh, investment managers that you can see around the world. Okay, so that is something that we want to be able to preserve. Of course, because one is going to be listed, one is going to be unlisted, we want to make sure that there is proper governance structure, okay, proper shared services agreement that is going to be signed between the two entities but making sure that we do not want to, simply because we do a restructuring, we do not want to, to preserve the advantage that the existing capital and system has to drive the growth of the investment management business. Okay, so that's the, even though uh, uh, Grace has uh, given you an uh, expectation I was going to do, do a long presentation, it's never my style. Uh, if I can explain in fewer words to you, that's always been my preference. I hope that my short explanation has given you a clear idea be two things. One is the strategic rationale why we are doing this deal and what is in, in it for the shareholders to support this particular transaction. And I leave uh, Andrew, you know, who speaks very good Queen's English, to be able to share with you more details about the growth prospects of uh, the investment management business. Thank you. So well, thanks, Jikun, for doing the hard part of the presentation. Uh, it remains for me to introduce um, Klim to all of you, something that we fully believe in uh, 100%. So maybe you want to take 30 seconds to digest what just went on. I know it's a, a lot to take in. Uh, we will have a full Q&A session for, to answer your questions. So the second half of the presentation, I'll introduce Klim the listed part of the Capital Land Group going forward. 
We believe that Klim will be a leading global real estate investment manager. And here's why. Try to think about Klim the way uh, we have set it up. We believe that there are two parts to Klim. On the left-hand side is what, we call, what I like to call the income side of the business. These comprise two uh, groups. One, stakes in our REITs and our private funds. These you know well. These give us recurring income through a share of distributions. Two, we have put in about 10 billion of, as Chikun mentioned, highly visible uh, near-term recycling candidates into the balance sheet of Klim. So this will give us, again, income in the near term. But what it importantly gives us is the ability to recycle. And you guys know how committed we are to recycling. This is the income part of the business. But really, the exciting part is growth. And that's on the right-hand side. As you, again, you have been pestering us to focus on and we've been listening. The growth part of the business also comprises two parts. One is our funds management platform. Okay, this is where we get our FUM. It's essentially our stakes, in our, or rather our REIT managers and our fund managers. We've been growing our FUM at 11% CAGR, focus on growth over the last five years. We are the largest S REIT BT platform on the SGX, about 77 billion in FUM. Second part of the growth platform is our lodging business. And this is a, an area that hopefully from now on will get the recognition that the market uh, will give it because we think this is prime to be a key part of the growth story for Klim. It's a global SR manager. We are arguably the leading long-stay service residence operator and owner in the world. 122,000 keys under management with a target to hit 160,000 by 2023. We have been growing our keys, as you will see, by about 19% CAGR. And this brings with it very, very ROE accretive fee income, very, very asset light, very capital efficient. So that's why it belongs on the growth side of this chart. Total AUM, 115 billion of CLIM. Over 100 billion is on the right-hand side, already earning fee income or soon to be earning fee income. The left-hand side is the remaining AUM that hopefully will be turned into FUM before too long. So I hope that gives you a picture of how we are organizing Klim. Income on the left, growth on the right. Now for those of you who follow REIMs, uh, right, real estate investment managers, each of these uh, investment managers possess a mix of income and growth. There's a spectrum of how much the business is in income, how much of the business is in growth. I want to leave with you today that we are not the finished article on day one. We, have, we will have a mix of income, we will have a mix of growth. We want to grow that right-hand side as quickly as possible so that that becomes the major contributor to Klim's profitability and earnings growth going forward. But it will not be the case on day one. But we want to set the stage to have the vehicle to allow us with the capital base, with the asset pipeline, with a stable recurring income base with which to fuel our growth of FUM on the right-hand side. Klim will have a full stack of investment and operating capabilities. So here we've organized it again by FUM. So you follow through the 78 billion of FUM on the rightmost column. We've split that up into a listed platform, which you know very well. We have three global read platforms. We have three country-focused read platforms. We have, we're going to go forward and grow three streams, core streams of uh, fee-related earnings, commercial and integrated, new economy, thanks to the combination with Ascenders two years ago, and finally, lodging. So there will be key three core income streams that we will focus on, and we'll have a, a fourth column for alternative assets, such as credit, and perhaps new businesses that we will incubate and grow fee income going forward. So the listed platform takes up 52 billion of FUM, the unlisted platform, we've got 25, 26 PE funds with new funds coming on stream, currently representing 26 billion. This is again another high growth area for us. I think to date, it's probably fair for us to acknowledge that this has been sli slightly slow in taking off the ground. But by again sharpening our focus on growth, we think we will allow us to really um, focus on growing the PE side of the business going forward. 
different strategies that currently exist, again, very widespread across core, core plus. We now have a credit fund and we have value add and opportunistic capabilities across our multi-sectors. Last but not least, and I think this is a key differentiation point with other uh, investment managers, we have a best-in-class in-house operating capability across all of these sectors in our core markets. And I think this allows us to value add very, very effectively on our ability to grow the asset uh, and add value to the value of the underlying IP. This we have in our core markets. We will outsource this to our partners in our growth and secondary markets, and particularly new businesses. So when you combine all of this together, I think you, you start to see that Klim comes together very, very effectively, very, in a very compelling way, where you've got the asset platforms, you've got the operating businesses, and you've got this coming together in a very synergistic, efficient, and scalable platform. So those two slides, I just want to give you a, a heads up, or a big overview of what Klim is designed to do. Five key takeaways, if you were to write your headlines, as to why we think Klim can be a leading global real estate investment manager. We are a global leader in, in, in global REAM, but we're also Asia-centric. We have a proven fund management track record. It's a highly scalable pipeline. We have a world-class, very distinctive lodging management platform, and finally, an experienced investment and asset management team. So let's look at scale. So here we have the top 15, I believe, uh, REIMs. The red dotted boxes are the listed platforms. So right off the bat, there is scarcity value in investing in a listed REIM. There are only three on the top 15. And if you look at the flags, there's actually only one that is domiciled in Asia, and that will be Klim. So we think that this positions Klim very, very well in profile, in being investable, and being part of this very, very select group of highly valued investment managers. This slide gives you a sense of the breakdown in REAUM as well as FUM. Focus on the right-hand side where you look at the red box, you see that 80% of our FUM are actually in Asia. That's why we say that while we are a global manager, we are actually very much anchored in Asia. A lot of the FUM is sitting in our core markets. So you see Singapore, China, India, where we have very strong growth, other Asia, including Australia, and then we've got our international business. We also break out REAUM and, and FUM to give you an indication that the REAUM is hopefully future FUM as we convert that on balance sheet investment port property portfolio into assets that sit in our funds and our REITs and allow us to earn FRE. And of course, if you look at the lodging column, you see a very, very large REAUM. That's our ESCOT business where we are managing current uh, units as well as future keys under construction that will then be part of our FRE. Okay, let's look at track record. And for these slides, I want to focus on FUM, right? So this is the part of the business that is under our REITs and our funds. Five years ago, we were 46 billion FUM. I would say... Retail heavy, 53% of FUM was in retail. After five years of 11% CAGR in FUM, we are now 78 billion. And if you look at the pie, much more balanced, much more diversified, 25% in new economy FUM. So I think this speaks to the track record of the group in not only delivering a nice growth CAGR in FUM, which earns fees, but also achieving much better balance, much better diversity across the investment portfolio. Together with FUM, on the left-hand side, for which we earn, have been earning an average of about 40 basis points on each dollar of FUM, we have been growing our fee income at a clip of about 12% over the last three years and earning an average EBITDA margin of 56%. This again flows down to the profitability, the future profitability of Klim. Capital recycling, key part of the group for those of you who have been following us for the last three years. We have really upped our game, staying committed, disciplined, focused on making sure we are 
recycling capital uh, when the time is right. So on the left-hand side, you see our gross value capital recycling over the last three years. I've separated the capital that we recycled from sponsor in blue and the capital that we recycled through our REITs in dark blue to show you that the light blue part is what's important, the ability of sponsor to recycle that capital. And more than five billion of that capital has been recycled into Capital Land REITs and BTs. So think about what we were talked about just now, the ability to take the income side of Klim, convert it into the growth side of Klim, earning FUM, part of FUM, and turning it into FRE, right? This is the track record that we want to put in front of investors. We've been committed to doing this. We've done more than five billion in the last five years and achieved a premium of more than 11% over fair value in the process of doing so. On the other side, our off-take vehicles, our REITs, BTs, private funds, have successfully raised, coincidentally, about five billion in third-party equity. So this very virtuous cycle that all REIMs must possess Again, we have the ability to show investors that we can do this. The off-take vehicles are able to raise third-party capital when they buy our assets from us as a sponsor. And this is something we will do out of the gate for Klim, or hope to do, continue to do with Klim. In terms of being an investment manager on the PE side, on this side here, so you see the breakdown by type of PE client, and also the geography, again, focusing on the diversity and the breadth of our PE clientele. Many repeat investors across our fund vintages. You look at our fund names, you've got one, two, three. These are continuing iterations of the same investment theme, often with the same set of LPs coming on board because they see value in sticking along for the ride. So we have this ability to continue to pull highest quality pension funds, SWFs, into our private equity business. We still have about a billion dollars of third-party capital ready for deployment. That again is FRE that is embedded and FRE that will be built into the program. And again, I also admit to you that this is something that we want to really, really focus on with the formation of Klim. On the capital side, a lot of this capital is actually long-term slash permanent in the form of equity at our REIT level. So this is FUM and FRE that's not going anywhere anytime soon. In fact, it's quasi-permanent. Third point, pipeline. Okay, so this part speaks to the balance sheet assets that we will have on Klim, about 10 billion of highly visible, stable, uh, ready to be monetized within the short term. We wanted to arm Klim with the ability to recycle capital and build FRE, FUM, and hopefully portfolio gains in the process. So again, a target monetization period for this portfolio that sits in various countries, sits in various sectors, to be um, divested, hopefully, into all of our various REITs and offtake vehicles. Given our track record of three plus billion a year, we believe within three years or so, we can have the entire IP portfolio fully divested and recycled into FUM and FRE. Again, I remind you of the average premium we have achieved. It's been about 11% over fair value. That is portfolio gain that is embedded into the program. And this is where I think we really have to deliver. This is the growth promise or the growth commitment that we have to our investors. Okay, going back to 2015, 46 billion FUM, 2020, 78 billion, CAGR of 11% over this five-year period. Uh, John has come out to say that our target is 100 billion by 2024. If I extrapolate the 11% by 2024, we are comfortably north of 100 billion. So this is something that I think, as a management team, we will have to commit to, given we've come out publicly said it. Now we have the means to achieve that. We've given some examples here. First off, we're already on our way, one billion this year to date and counting, most recently with the acquisition of third party FUM via AREIT and the uh, $1 billion data center portfolio. More to come this year, hopefully. Then we have the Klim pipeline, right? This is on balance sheet, IP, 10 billion in the next three years. Our REITs as well as ourselves will go out and look for third-party acquisitions where we are now dedicated to hunting to grow potential FUM, future FRE. 
on the right hand side, the investment portfolio that has will be taken private together with Capital Land Development. This is a slightly longer term gestation portfolio. Things like Jewel, things like RCCQ that have not been put into Klim for a very specific reason. We believe that this will take slightly longer to stabilize, put us in position to then acquire it later on. This constitutes about 7.6 billion of that. So this is future pipeline. But I would say within the next five years, yes, monetizable. And last but certainly not least, strategic m and when you have a platform that Klim uh, will be possessed with, very, very strong balance sheet, hopefully trading well with equity currency to go out and look for other platforms for which to inorganically grow our FUM and FRE as the third largest REIUM uh, listed out there. I think it gives us that capability, gives us that profile to go out and make leaps as we saw with ASB two years ago. And that's where the step change really can come in. So when you add these four components and you think about an 11% CAGR to take us to north of 100 billion by 2024, I hope you will agree with me that this is something that we can certainly achieve with good execution and perhaps a little bit of luck. I'll spend five minutes talking about lodging because we seldom do. And I think it's time, it's long overdue we talk about lodging. Because lodging is a key in our view, distinctive engine that also separates Klim from your other REIMs out there. Okay. Our lodging platform is full stack. We have the assets under our REITs and our funds, some of it on balance sheet. But equally important, perhaps even more so, we have a world-class global lodging platform and a brand portfolio that is highly recognizable. One of Singapore's champions, Ascot Brand. Recurring fee income, strong brand equity, expensive ownership network around the world. Many, many owners are multiple assets with us and highly capital efficient, high ROE. Okay, this, this, the more we scale, the more it drives fee income, more it drives ROE. And I believe we are in a very, very interesting inflection point for uh, lodging. I talked earlier about our CAGR. So we've been doing about a 20% CAGR clip in units. The dark blue part are the keys already in operation. The light blue part are the keys that are currently committed and under construction. So this is FRE that is already embedded, not yet earning into the system. This is coming. At this clip, we will easily meet our 160,000 target uh, which Kevin mentioned a couple of years ago. The SR lodging business, contrary to belief, is actually very, very fee generative. Our average is 70, 70 beeps as a percentage of AUM. So it's actually more profitable than our FUM FRE business, which was about 40 basis point clip, right? Sorry, I forgot to mention this the fee income FUM average is about 40 basis points. That's not SR. SR has been running historically about 70 basis points. So the faster we can grow SR, assuming we can continue to deliver the same types of management contracts with asset owners, will actually even improve the profitability of the business as we scale up further. The track record of growth, we have four consecutive years of record growth. Last year, amidst COVID, we signed 14,000 keys, an all-time high for Capital Land. So I want to leave with you that this is highly ROE accretive. I don't think it's valued at all by many investors. So this is upside. We estimate that for every 10,000 stabilized keys, we contribute about 20 to 25 million in fee income. And as we scale up, this fee income drops straight to the bottom line because we've covered our operating costs. And we are close to being past that inflection point with every new key that we open to the system. And the target is obviously to maintain this historical CAGR growth over the medium term. That is our traditional bread and butter SR business. Recently, those of you who follow us will have seen that we've been doing other things. We've been expanding the definition of what long stay is to us. Siu Kim has gone into PBSA as an asset owner. We've also signed a joint venture with a US, leading US developer on a programmatic build-out of multifamily. So there are 
initiatives underway to further our reach into the long-stay sector. This will be FUM, mainly asset-driven, owned by ART eventually, or one of our funds. So this is, again, additional growth on top of the traditional SR growth that I talked about earlier. And I want to just leave with you that I think COVID, if anything, has demonstrated that the long-stay part of the hospitality business is particularly resilient. It's demonstrated operating resilience in what was perhaps the most challenging uh, uh, year to face the hospitality industry ever. You see the evidence of that turnaround coming in. In the meantime, we were able to divest specific assets at very, very high premiums to fair value. And so we think that as this optimism continues to grow and we enter into a recovery phase, touch wood, the positioning of lodging at this point in time is very positive. And if it continues to take off, then I think it gives the, our lodging business extra impetus and extra momentum to grow. And finally, we can't be an investment manager if you don't have investment manage, management people running around looking for the right assets and outsmarting our competition, both in looking for assets and in outperforming in terms of operations. We have over 400 IAM professionals currently, globally, across 30 countries. And the track record from the last three years is a successful acquisition of close to 7 billion in third-party assets. So this is nothing to do with sponsor. This is our teams going out, hunt, locate assets for our REITs, our funds, and for us to incubate on balance sheet. So the team is largely already in place. We can hit the ground running. We are already hunting as we speak. But when Klim is formed, they hit the ground running, continue to drive this growth in FUM, FRE, for all of our platforms. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, just to echo uh, the key parts of, of Chikun's first part, uh, which is actually very critical. This is the next phase in our transformation. Right? This is a journey. It's not an end point. It is the next phase that I think was largely made possible in, in great detail by our, our initial combination with ASB, giving us the platform to really think about how we restructure the business. By matching the private side with the public side, private with development, and the public with something that is valued highly by the market, we believe we will match capital with risk. Match the right structure, match the right capital partners. We think we're doing it in a very fair way, unlocking a value for our shareholders in the short term at a substantial premium. And at the same time, we create Klim, which has a lot of the hallmarks that are highly valued by the market, which will position Klim to trade very well out of the gate. It's highly capital efficient, very scalable. We have a unique distinction of having best in class operations. And again, Uniquely, we, have a, we are a global leader in long-stay lodging. So we've got three very, very useful fee income streams. Private development will play a very, very important role because it will be our incubator, our capital partner. We will have the ability to avail ourselves of development capabilities and also to share services and senior management ideas, not to mention a pipeline for future properties into Klim. We are incredibly proud of the ecosystem we have built, the DNA that we have, the values that we have through the last 20 years, and it was absolutely critical for us that with this restructuring, we do not lose that. And I think the way we have designed the restructuring uh, is central to that idea of keeping the DNA and the resilience of the group intact while we split the two companies. Okay, very quickly on summaries, we have got a couple of uh, big meetings coming up. So now we get to the process of seeking minority shareholder report. Uh, there will be an EGM for which we will seek uh, minority shareholder approval to approve the capital reduction in order for us to distribute the two units of shares, the new Klim shares, as well as the 6% of CICT. Because this is an interested party, CLA will not participate in the vote, but they will also choose not to participate in the distribution of CICT units. And then finally, the scheme meeting, which will be the privatization of the group. Timelines uh, today, 
marks the start of the execution phase. In and around the third quarter, we will dispatch the scheme document. Slightly thereafter, we will have an EGM and the scheme meeting. We hope to complete this early 4Q and have claim trading before the year is out. Okay, I think with that, I've spoken enough. I may uh, hand it back to Grace and we'll uh, take can questions. I, yep. Okay. And uh, can I invite Chikun to also join us? Andrew, please stay. Oh, sure. Okay, thank you, Andrew and Chi Kun. We'll start a Q&A. We also have uh, received some questions on a webcast, so we'll try to give some time uh, later on. But uh, let's start with the, the guests that we have. Grace, before, uh, maybe yeah? I just, allow me to just say a few, uh, make one, two more comments. Um, uh, thank you all for, for, for you know, sitting through the entire presentation. I just want to remind that uh, this, I mean, the, the management team has been working extremely hard in the transformation of Capital N to make Capital N a lot more competitive, uh, uh, a lot uh, in terms of uh, driving new, new growth and uh, new revenue streams for, for the company. And this restructuring exercise, I mean, you know, we are uh, splitting into two entities shuffling assets and capabilities. This is really only step one. It is not a, a magic or silver bullet that's going to get us to the uh, end point uh, at the very beginning. It takes hard work. Uh, it takes uh, dedication, uh, making sure that you know, we are razor focused, uh, build the DNA, stay very disciplined. And uh, just want to, uh, uh, you know, just to remind everybody that it takes time to get there but uh, we are totally committed to make sure that we build the team and execute well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And with that, um, I'll open the floor for questions. Derek from Macquarie. Hi, <coughs> exciting times indeed. Um, so a few questions from me. First is on the capital structure itself. Can you talk a little bit about the gearing at both entities, the private flight and the, uh, the privatized entity as well as the listed entity? And do you have a dividend policy going forward? The second question is on the mandate. Can I confirm that Klim uh, will not be acquiring completed assets and that will be left to the REITs itself? Or will they still be buying completed assets just like the REIT? Okay. The last one is on earnings itself. Can you provide a pro forma split between the two entities um, based on last year's numbers, just as a reference point for us. Thanks, Thanks Derek. Uh, let me do the gearing. So we, the numbers are the numbers right now. We will not be, unfortunately, be able to share numbers, including earnings for now. But so please be patient. I know, it's, I know you want it. It will come with the, with, uh, in due course. But one of the reasons why we decided to uh, distribute CICT was to uh, allow us to deconsolidate CICT from Klim. And uh, as a happy coincidence, if you deconsolidate CICT, we also deconsolidate CLCT. So when you do this, the balance sheet of Klim opens up and gives us that ability, as I mentioned, to go out and look for growth. And we felt that at 6% of a DIS was not too much to ask of uh, CICT. We wouldn't stress or strain the CICT uh, trading too much. So we, we took a very considered view as to how do we achieve the right cap structure at Klim, give it the firepower, the headroom to go, but at the same time not, uh, not disadvantage our REITs unduly uh, as, in doing so. So that's number one. Uh, earnings, I, I, I can't share with you right now. Apologize for that, but please be patient, it will come. And then maybe Chikun. Dividend uh, policy? Yeah. Div policy also, uh, we, we'll, we'll think about it. Um, I will be spending a lot of time with our investors, and we will be spending a lot of time with our investors. Now, you want claim to be a yield stock, or do you want claim to be a growth stock? Because yes. you can't have it both ways. <laughs> I know everybody wants their cake and they want to eat it. Um, so, uh, I think you will hopefully have taken away that our focus on Klim out of the gate is growth. It's all about finding ways to grow FUM, FRE, uh, and REAUM on the lodging side. So how, if, if we do that, then something has to give. Uh. 
I'm not saying we won't pay any dividends, but I, I, I would hope that the emphasis will shift from how much yield are you going to give us, how, many, how, much, how many cents in dividend are you going to give us to what's your EPS growth, right? what's your FUM growth, what's your FRE growth. If our, if our, our quarterly and our semi-annual sessions start to become uh, discussions around these topics, then I think that's probably the, the right uh, pivot going forward. hope that answers your question. In terms of um, acquisitions of uh, completed properties, as a general rule of thumb, um, the REITs should be the entities that uh, look for all these uh, acquisition opportunities. But uh, in the event that there are interesting um, repositioning uh, type uh, opportunities that can always be done through one of the private equity fund entities set up under the CLIM, or we could even use a, a balance sheet and subsequently sell it down to, to uh, other capital partners. So I, I wouldn't just say that uh, it is one way or other, it really depends on the opportunities that we can find. And uh, best match against the, uh, the opportunity against the, the, the capital that can best deliver the returns. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll have Joy. Ladies first. Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. Just uh, two questions from me. Uh, one is on the timing. Uh, why do it now? Uh, you lay out a sort of a plan of AUM growth at, at the beginning of the year. Why not wait for that plan to show sort of a few, uh, show more growth before doing this? Um, so that's uh, first question from me. Uh, second question, more on sort of development capabilities. Um, are you giving away the entire development capabilities of the investment properties? In a sense, will you still be able to raise development funds in the future? I answer the second question first. Yes, uh, CLIM will continue to be able to raise uh, development funds. All fund raising fund management capabilities will be done by CLIM. So in the event that uh, you want to participate in development projects that we can still see upside, I think that can still be done through the fund arrangement. Uh, but in development capabilities, especially in the core markets where the uh, privatised entity can support, I think this is an excellent area to continue to, to uh, collaborate and where CLIM uh, shareholders can continue to enjoy the development upside without a, a, a huge amount of uh, capital outlay from the very get-go. So that's my response on the development uh, question. Go to the uh, private side. Yes, okay. definitely. But the fund management and the asset management. So, but the details are, are yet uh, to be worked out. But well, we want to be clear in terms of the areas of uh, uh, responsibilities. In terms of uh, timing, uh, I think first and foremost, uh, we are clear in terms of uh, the uh, broader strategy and direction for for Capital Land meaning that we want to be a competitive real estate developer and a global asset manager. Uh, this, uh, uh, I, I don't think there will be a best time to look at this opportunity. If you look at the trading history of capital and whether it's one year, five year, 10 year, consistently we trade at 20 to 30% discount to uh, NAF. Uh, it is something that uh, we want to be able to do and then create uh, a vehicle that will give us the share currency to pursue uh, growth. So that would be my response in terms of uh, the timing issue. Yeah. Thank you. I have Terence from JPM. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, congrats on the restructuring. Uh, just three questions from me. Um, can I ask about the existing ROFA and ROFA for future developments for the REITs, uh, how would this be split between uh, the privatised entity and CLIM? Secondly, um, is there a ROE target for CLIM? And uh, finally, in terms of deconsolidation, uh, would you be looking at deconsolidating some of the other REITs under CLIM? And how would this be achieved? Thanks. So rofers, I, I, I expect that there will be some form of strategic arrangements between DEFCO and, um, and CLIM. Uh, it, would, it would be 
imprudent of us not to have that in place. But at the same time, I don't think it should be such that it is ours or yours no matter what, right? So I think there needs to be that discipline and healthy tension between both entities. So it's, uh, I think that's where we will try to set that, that role firm. In terms of ROE, uh, the current ROE is to continue to deliver healthy ROE above cost of equity. If you look at uh, REIMs across the platform, actually the ROE range is very wide. And again, it goes back to what type of animal this is. If you're an investment heavy animal, uh, then you tend to have a lower ROE, your equity base is higher. If you are a very asset light ROE, then you have a, typically have a much higher ROE. So given that we are going to be on day one, I would say relatively more of the former, Right. We've still got a nice, healthy pipeline. We have a healthy stake in our REITs and funds and so on and so forth. I would say that this will position us to look to grow ROE over time as we convert that investment pipeline into uh, FUM and FRE and we decide what to do with that equity that is released, what we decide to do with that capital that is released. So we'll, we'll see where we are from day one. We'll start out at this construct that we have created and look to become more if ROE efficient over time. Third question, deconsole. Um, there's not, there are only two other REITs, I believe. That will be ART and CMMT. Um, I think we've come out publicly before to say that at the right time, we may look to, uh, to optimize the equity stakes. Uh, so there's no reason why we shouldn't do that. But we're also not going to be rash about it. Right? It will be div driven around uh, the stake that we create, the liquidity issues, the, psych the where we are in the sector, and so on and so forth. So we'll be very careful about uh, how we go about optimizing our REIT stakes. Uh, but I would say yes, the logic should see that let's optimize the equity as best we can because that's what Klim is going to be all about. We'll have Ryu Kyung from CLSA. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first one is relating to the structure. Um, can you run us through the uh, rationale for ruling in the lodgings? as well as the private funds into the business because uh, lodging seems to be under some pressure and, and I hear that earlier you mentioned low gestation period, high ROE, asset light, but this is all different from my understanding of the SR business. And then on the private funds, um, it should really come with a, a level of opaqueness, I think, in terms of uh, disclosure. So by rolling this into the entity, there's also another fee layer that you're paying additional as well, but you actually sacrifice on the transparency of that structure. So why did you not include like the office or data centers into CLIM? I, I think that's, that's the first question. And then second question is on your develop and emerging breakdown in terms of EBITDA level. Could you get a sense? Uh, I, I know. Andrew probably wouldn't want to disclose any more numbers. Okay. Okay, let me attempt to tackle one. <laughs> okay, so let's do the easy one first, FTSE NARI. Uh, FTSE NARI, okay, this is, um, we'll, we'll have to see how this lands, right? Uh, my understanding of FTSE NARI is that they don't like fund income. And if you are fund, in, you are fund manager, you drop off. I think it happened to Goodman. So for us, it will depend on the day one construct. If my balance sheet uh, investment EBITDA, which qualifies, is largely DM, which we believe it is, then there is a possibility that our EBITDA in the next, any, in the next 24 months will be more than 50% DM. And we will not contravene the fee income part of the requirement. So let's see where that, let it, where that ends up. I think we are cautiously optimistic that we may be able to qualify for FTSE NARI uh, based on the EBITDA coming from the balance sheet side of the business and our stakes. We'll see where that goes. Okay. Uh, we have two years to, to cure it in any event. I would say that we are committed to being a uh, REIM. And if, if that means that we can no longer be part of FTSE NARI, I think we are prepared to live with that We've taken that decision strategically. We will not, another way to read that is we will not tailor the business, the capital structure, so as to remain on FTSE NARI. I think that's probably fair to say. Okay. Um, PE transparency, uh, yes and no. 
of course, there will be elements of the PE business which we will not share to protect uh, the, 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 the necessary um, uh, anonymity and the proprietary nature of the PE business. But given that the PE business is part of uh, REIM, there are many uh, REIMs out there that have a very, very strong PE business, it, I think it would be much harder for us to explain why <laughs> PE is not part of CLIM and is privatised. It's part of the private side of the business. I mean, it earns fee income. We are absolutely committed to growing the PE side of the business. How much we can share with you will be a function of the funds themselves, how they are structured, the LP requirements, and so on and so forth. So yes, you may see a level of opacity with, in terms of being able to penetrate through what the actual funds are. But in terms of our ability to report overall income, fees, you know, overall fees on an on a aggregate basis, contribution to profit, so on and so forth, you know, basis points per dollar of FUM. I think these things should be uh, non-controversial. I can't give you what a specific fund is going to earn, uh, but I can sh surely provide it to you in aggregate and give you a sense of how strong the PE business is and what the growth trajectory and contribution from the PE business to the overall CLIM business is going to be. I think that should be something we should be able to do. Uh, last question, lodging, okay. Um, so I don't want to go back to the slides again, but I think what's important to distinguish is that yes, there's an asset owning part of the business, right? That's ART and uh, Asquad Growth Fund. But what Kevin has been absolutely focused on doing in growing the keys under management is on a management contract basis. So super asset light. We don't own these assets. We want to charge a fee for managing these assets on behalf of third-party asset owners. That fee historically has been 70 basis points per AUM dollar of uh, SR lodging. So historically, it tells us, actually, this is a very good fee income business. You know, the margins aren't great right now because we are still in a scale-up phase. But the message I wanted to leave with you is I think we are coming to an inflection point where once you get into the 120, 130, 160,000 range, that scale economy really kicks in. And for every 10,000 keys that we then stabilize and get into the system, it earns 20, 25 million of fees. The operating costs, are, you get a margin of 70 basis points. And after that, it drops to the bottom line. You no longer have to worry about paying for your IT's platform and the centralized cost of operations because you've already covered that through the initial portfolio that you've built in. So to us, this is very capital efficient it will be, in our opinion, highly ROE accretive, but we have to get to that scale for it to do so and contribute meaningfully to the bottom line. And the point I was trying to leave with you, hopefully, was that we are coming to that inflection point at about 120,000, 130,000 keys, where that once these keys stabilize and come in and earn fees for us, we start to really accelerate in terms of margin and contribution to overall CLIM bottom line. In, just to add on to Andrew's point on lodging, um, in um, I mean many years ago, the Escort's uh, portfolio under Capital Land uh, typically was uh, pretty asset heavy. I mean the, there was no real uh, intention or commitment to want to uh, manage uh, third party assets. Uh, I think that had changed uh, very significantly over the last uh, um, I would say the last ten years and they built up a nice uh, uh, fee income that has uh, flown through. I mean, my own uh, personal experience when I was first sent to China to run the, the Escort China business in 2009, I mean, it was, uh, we hardly had, I think we were like 11 or 12 properties. Today we are in China more than 150 over properties and we really only own 10% of the portfolio or less than that. And the rest are all fee income flowing through very nicely, adding on and uh, doing extremely well. And it is a business that's growing extremely, uh, uh, I mean, the cost structure is fixed and the fee income, every property that you open flows quite nicely to the bottom line. So, I mean, it requires hard work. It requires a lot of uh, 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 management, active management, negotiation. But every time you lock in a management contract, it lasts for 20 years. So, so it's really a commitment to grow the fee income. That's uh, important, yeah. Thank you. Um, we will take one more question from the floor before we give some time to the webcast audience and we'll come back. I, 
Let's have uh, VJ from RHB. Hi. Thanks. Congrats on the restructuring. I just have two questions. Uh, maybe can you comment a bit on the management structure changes post this transaction, and uh, how do you ensure a smooth transaction of management structure uh, in the recent years, especially which I think is key to the success of Klim going forward? Mm -hmm. And my second question is on the Klim pipeline. I think, Andrew, you mentioned that the $11 billion pipeline is going to be for next three years, which you would be injecting the assets into the REITs or private funds. How do you ensure the growth of the Klim pipeline? Uh, would this be from a third party assets per se, because you mentioned that capital and development is, will take three to five years to grow. So would this be from a third party asset? And especially in this low interest rate environment, how do you plan to grow this pipeline? And what target will you have for the next three, five years per se? That's all. Thank you. The, the, I think the initial investment properties on Klim's balance sheet will provide the initial growth uh, impetus. After that, of course, uh, there will be pipeline from um, the uh, privatized entity. Uh, I think more importantly, we, in, at the claim level, we do really need to actively go out to look for new opportunities from third party, other developers, other portfolio. I mean, that's really the job of the uh, investment professionals. Uh, the aim, of course, you know, we hope to be able to build up a, a track record to be able to do more off-market type transactions. And that requires very strong uh, a team of uh, investment professionals around the various key markets that we intend to, to uh, work through. Um, I, I mean, if you look at the recent uh, deal announced by AREIT, uh, it is uh, data centers in Europe, uh, work very closely between our uh, uh, the investment team together with the, the AREIT team to look for such opportunities. Uh, of, of, of course, I know that the uh, Competition is, is stiff. There's a lot of capital chasing. So it really depends on the, the strength and the quality of the investment professionals that we have. So your other question is... Uh, oh, the management structure. So uh, I, we haven't uh, really announced the full details of the uh, uh, management. At this point in time, um, uh, we have announced that I will be the, the CEO of the... Uh, the capital investment management. Uh, Andrew will be the CFO. Uh, we'll give more details in terms, in terms of the ox structure uh, by the time the circular is uh, ready. But uh, safe to say, I mean, we have uh, the first cut in terms of uh, how we want to organize ourselves. We need to make sure that the uh, right uh, groups of uh, people are in the uh, right entity so that you can drive the growth and build that, that culture to hunt for assets and to be very disciplined in terms of capital recycling. Yeah. Sorry, just also want to clarify one thing. In terms of claim acquisition, when you look at the asset, how would you differentiate between whether it is for the claim portion or for the REITs or the private funds, since both of them are holding income producing assets? So it, this is quite common in the investment community where if you have a private equity fund and you have REITs or you have your own balance sheet, there's always a deal allocation committee. Uh, when an asset is, becomes available, if it's something that really cuts across all three, you have to make it available to all the three different entities. Otherwise, it depends on the mandate. So uh, there is not so... How should I say? There will be areas where you may see joint investments and there will be some clear-cut cases where it should go directly into one particular REIT or into a private equity fund. Yeah. Thanks. I think there's also... This is linked to a question that Dawn has just come out. So what if the REITs and Klim both want to acquire the same assets from, from CLA? So I think that uh, Chikun's answer speaks to that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll have Brendan from CNA. Brendan has a question. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just one question. Could I get the outlook for like the short term and the long term, given that the pandemic is still here with us and we're still feeling the impacts of it? Um, in my own view is, uh, if you look at the capital exposure that we have in the existing capital land group, uh, majority of our capital is exposed to Singapore and China. And uh, my own view, I... I I, I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, with the vaccination rollout, I, my own sense is that the worst of uh, COVID-19 is uh, behind us. 
uh, and uh, we should be in the in the phase of a uh, recovery. So that's my 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 own uh, personal view at this point in time, and that's why we also think that uh, it is right to to accelerate our transformation, and time to uh, propose this uh, restructuring exercise. I think we still have a number of raised hands. Uh, I think we'll take a few more questions from the floor before we go to uh, our webcast audience. Oh, can I have uh, Brandon from City? Hey, uh, thanks for the press. Uh, just two questions on valuations. Uh, can you sort of uh, walk us through why you decided to pay uh, one times book for Klim? And secondly, and why you are exiting the development business at 0.95 times book when I think over the years, Chikun, you have been talking a lot about asset rejuvenation, science park, and things like that. Do you think it's a bit too early to exit this business and not allow uh, existing shareholders to benefit from it. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, uh, good question. In terms of CLIM, uh, where it will trade, we don't know. Um, I mean, we, in terms of the, if you look at the build up, uh, really, we are just saying hypothetically, if it trades at uh, one times book, this will be how the implied consideration will work out to be. So it, a lot depends on the, how, how CLIM will trade uh, when it gets listed. Uh, in terms of the uh, development side of the business, I think there is uh, uh, upside, definitely. There is also potential risk. Uh, I want to just mention that and emphasize that the development business is uh, long-term. It requires very patient capital. Business cycles are getting a lot shorter. Uh, so are investors, uh, in terms of the, the level of patience that they have in terms of looking at uh, uh, returns from uh, projects, uh, if you look at the entire deal construct, uh, what is uh, Capital N uh, actually, uh, what is CLA taking private? It is the 30% of the business which you have development projects, residential, Singapore, China, and also investment properties that are going to take longer, typically longer than three years before you can be ready for recycling. Uh, my own view is that uh, to be able to get uh, immediate uh, realization of value at 0.95 times uh, is actually a good deal. Uh, of course, uh, at the end of the day, we do require the views from the independent FA uh, that, uh, we, that will be issued together with the circular to advise the minority share shareholders on their opinion on the merits of the entire transaction to the shareholders. Uh, I, I, I am of the view that, you know, be able to unlock value immediately and be able to participate on the uh, capital and investment management that's going to be listed. And uh, if you look at the trading comparables of uh, other uh, real estate investment managers, I think, it, one, you get to unlock value. Secondly, you get to enjoy the right if we run it properly. So I, I, on, on balance, I actually think that it's a, it's a good transaction for minority shareholders. Uh, just a uh, follow up on that is, uh, can you sort of share with us a rough percentage of the NAV of the development business that, that you kind of uh, written off in FY20? Sorry, what's the question again? Uh, uh, the, the amount of impairment slash write downs that, that, that you recognize in FY20 for the development business. The development business. So impairments last year was about one, was it about a billion? One point, yeah, about a billion. 900 million. Yeah, 900 million of which half effectively was Lai Fang, right? So the balance is, is I would say, uh, development properties for sale that were impaired down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks. Thanks, hey. Andrew and Chikun. Thanks, Brent. Okay. Any more reasons? Derek from DBS. And then we go to Tanshin. Hello. Thank you, uh, guys, first, sorry. Uh, three questions for me. I'm just wondering for the first question on lodging. I think, Jikun, you mentioned that it's uh, unique to the group, but just wondering whether, in the longer term, would you want investors to give you some form of operator premium for it, or do you think that one thing stabilised, the lodging business uh, can actually stand alone by itself? Uh... Derek, I, I think that um, as a responsible manager, we will continuously look at options. 
uh, down the line. But I think at this point in time, we have uh, taken the view that the, the lodging business should be part of CLIM. I mean, subsequently, you know, the, the, let's say the lodging business is going to grow so big and require so much capital that the uh, CLIMS uh, as an entity cannot support its growth then we can look at the different types of uh, liquidity options. Yeah. But at this point in time, I think it fits quite nicely for under the whole claims business. Okay, thank you. My second question is on the asset split. I'm just looking at one of your slides. Uh, I just thought that some assets that sit on the capital land development actually suit claims. So I'm just wondering whether post before completion, are those, can some of those assets be actually sold if there's the opportunity? comes about, or is there a moratorium in terms of sale for both entities? The, the rule of thumb, the general rule of thumb, how we have split the asset, it's uh, in terms of the readiness for recycling. So things that are going to take more than three years to recycle, typically we put it under the, uh, the private side. Of course, there are certain assets that is kept under the development side because of tax issues, tax considerations, because if you were to move it, immediately you end up having to pay prohibitive taxes. So those are, there are some of, I mean, a few of those assets that is kept in the development side for those reasons. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My last question is on, I think we have a very exciting story about Science Park redevelopment. I'm just wondering going forward, is it more on the private side or the public side, just to clarify? Uh, I, it will be both. It will, it will be an uh, arrangement between the, the private side together with uh, the asset that sits with the ARID. So, I mean, we have not really worked out how is the entire redevelopment going to be funded. Uh, it could be uh, several joint venture arrangements so that, you know, the, the uh, various stakeholders could benefit from that. And as and when we are ready, we'll definitely be, be we'll share with the, the team when we are ready with the structure. Thanks. Tanshin. <coughs> Hi, uh, this is Tanshin here. Um, two questions. Firstly, um, how do you address what, what are your thoughts on hate count, uh, increase in hate count and cost of the overall group, and how can you mitigate the in potential increase in cost? And secondly, what are the measures in place to mitigate the conflict of interest between the listed REITs? Claim as well as a development business, and especially if we think about greenfield developments, will they go through the development business claim and then even eventually the REITs, and will there still be value left for the REITs when assets reach that stage? Uh, I answered the first questions on uh, governance. Uh, proper governance will definitely be put in place. There will be service level agreements between the various listed entities. It's going to be a bit more, more cumbersome, but uh, I think at the end of the day, we want to make sure that whatever we do is in the interest of all shareholders. So that's something that we will always put at the top of our priority. Ecosystem remains important, but I think we need to make sure we put in place proper governance. Uh, with regards to the uh, projects, I, I think uh, for every project that um, becomes available if it's pure greenfield type projects. Uh, my own sense is that it's likely to go on the balance sheet of um, the uh, private entity. But if there's a, there are interested uh, investors that want to come in, I think CLIM can always uh, raise uh, funds, bring in investors, and uh, work through together with the um, uh, capital and development side to bring to fruition the the projects and when the project is ready it can always be recycled into the reeds but uh, that like i said because every single uh, investment opportunity especially big one could come in different forms um, so it is very hard for me to prescribe one way of how we may or may not do the deal at the end of the day we want to make sure that the various stakeholders benefit from it the idea under the claim side is to grow the aum is to grow the, the size of the various REITs and to make sure that the private equity funds that we seed, uh, we find good investment opportunities and make sure that all the investors are happy with the investment returns. Otherwise, uh, the clean business itself, you'll find it very, very difficult to continue to raise money and to grow the, the, the fee business. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, uh, can I just follow up? 
cost and headcount? Oh, okay. In terms of cost and headcount, uh, maybe you can help me to clarify in terms of the concerns that you may have with regards to this particular point. Uh, I just uh, maybe just a point of uh, of uh, sharing. I mean. Um, we, as a group, we have been very, very disciplined in terms of the cost uh, uh, management. Uh, if you look at the way how we have been uh, rationalizing the, 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 the company, uh, making sure that we are competitive. Um, uh, I think uh, Andrew has shared that the uh, full year results are briefing that you know, our annual cost uh, savings as a group uh, through the efforts, rationalization, reorganizing, uh, have saved us uh, about $100 million of cost going forward. So it's something that we will do and want to continue to be competitive whether uh, restructuring takes place or not. Because if you cannot be competitive, you cannot have the right fee structure, cost structure to be competitive, no investors is going to want to invest together with you. Yeah. Um, what so, I mean is that I'm assuming that the private and public entity cannot share the same set of management and certain functions. Uh -huh. So does that mean there will be increase in headcount, oh. enhanced cost, uh, and what are the measures in place to mitigate that, if any? Okay, sorry, I, I didn't get your point. So we are going to put in place shared services agreement where services could be shared. Let's say, for instance, uh, we are going to set up a, a shared service, financial um, shared services function. We think that if you put in place proper uh, service level agreement, it could share, it could provide services to both the listed side and the unlisted side so that we can avoid uh, having additional headcount. So we are actually uh, putting a lot of um, uh, thoughts and structure to make sure that, you know, we, when you create two entities, you're not going to end up creating especially a lot of uh, uh, support function type of headcount. If we want to increase headcount, we need to increase more, more hunters uh, people that can look for deals, the leasing, the people that, that creates a lot more more value. Yeah, thank you. Hi, this is Terence from Credit Suisse. Uh, just wanted to ask to ask two questions to clarify. Uh, for the claim NAV per share of two dollars eight and eight eight two three cents, wanted to check if this value is based on the book value, not the market value of the the reads. Okay, so it's a book value. And also, the implied CLA consideration of one dollar and one to one cents. Uh, it said that it represents about zero point nine five uh, pro forma NEF of the capital land development part of the business. But could you help us to reconcile this number with the two dollar and sixty five NEF per share of the group after the distribution in specie that was disclosed in Appendix One? Um, Janine, can you uh, take this offline together and give the details to... to okay, thank you. thank you. One more question from you, Kang. Why CICT shares are used instead of other, the other REITs? Uh, simple answer is CICT and CLCT were still consolidated. We wanted to establish the right cap structure for CLIM. We landed on, well, what if we give some of these units out to our minority shareholders as part of this exercise, deconsolidate claim, give it the balance sheet it needs, provided we, we felt that this would not overly stress the register of CICT and CLCT in the process. So we decided after some very extensive work to, uh, on 6% being a number that we could live with, get us to our goal of deconsolidating but yet not stress, overly stress the, the trading and liquidity of uh, CICT. So that, that was it. Okay. Um, I would like to take a question from Donald Chua uh, from BAMO, who is not represented here. Uh, Donald asks, how would Klim select which assets to acquire from CLA? What if the REITs and Klim both want to acquire the same assets from CLA? So... I think let's clarify the, the chain here. I, the Klim has balance sheet assets that are short-term, high visibility, easily monetizable, we believe, in the next three years. The CLA assets, if I'm not mistaken, the ones that are going to be privatized, Donald's, that what you're referring to, are the longer gestation ones. The idea, obviously, is once these are incubated successfully and they are trading and they are stabilized and they're ready to be monetized, Ideally, they go straight to our offtake vehicles. Why, why take that intermediate step of getting into claim? There's absolutely no need to do so. 
So the idea really is that your off-take vehicles are, are just that. Uh, you take from Klim because these are short-term. We put the assets in that we believe we can recycle quickly. The ones that take slightly longer, we put into the privatized vehicle because it needs patient capital. And that can come into the REITs and funds as soon as they are ready. We think it will take slightly longer. There shouldn't be any competition between Klim and the REITs to acquire stabilized uh, uh, assets. Uh. The, to a related question earlier, there is a scenario where potentially Klim and the REITs co-acquire, right? Supposing you have a really interesting large platform, multi-billion dollar platform, but the REITs can't afford to take it all by themselves. I think that's where Klim can come into play, where we co-invest in that such a platform, and then that can be part of a program that gradually monetizes into the REIT or the fund. So that's one scenario. It answers a question that someone asked earlier, I think was from Centre Square, about whether the balance sheet side of the IP will wind down over time or will Klim look to replenish that part? I think that is that optionality that we have. We can use that released capital from the 11 billion that we are going to hopefully monetize in the next three years in a number of different ways. Right? We can look to acquire something that's very interesting in terms of a, a similar type of uh, management platform. We can co-invest with one of our off-take vehicles into something that looks very interesting to give it FUM uh, growth down the line, or we can decide to do something else with that capital if we can't find a better use for it. So that, I think, is very, very interesting and valuable optionality that we have as this $11 billion, uh, gets recycled over the next three years. Not, not to forget uh, that uh, if there are interesting uh, platform opportunities where there are development and operating assets, I think uh, um, the CL development and the uh, claim or even one of the REITs could jointly participate and bid for these projects. I think it gives uh, maximum flexibility to look at uh, investment opportunities together. Yeah. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Joy, you have a question? Yeah, just one follow-up on sort of operation over the next uh, nine months while you go through the deal. Would that affect sort of the, the, the REIT's ability to acquire and to raise capital. Um, and also from a clean perspective, you, if you look at some, you saw something that you're interested, would you go ahead with acquisition or you have to wait for the approval? Uh, I think there's a certain level of uh, uh, investment activities that uh, we can definitely do. The REITs can still uh, look for deals to acquire. Uh, once you get past uh, beyond a certain uh, size, I think we need to have the conversation. Uh, but I, I think the, the, the problem we have in the, today's uh, world is that there are, there's more money available than there are good projects. If there are good projects that can go, deliver good returns, I'm actually not worried about you know, having a conversation to see how we could uh, uh, work together to make the acquisitions. Yeah. Can they look at your 10 billion assets this year before the transaction is completed? Sorry, meaning we can we look at the uh, recycling? Can, can the yeah, yeah, yeah. Re recycling will continue. Yeah, we have a big program. <laughs> any more? Are there any more questions from the floor? If not, I will take one last question, and I think it's a good question to end. Um, we have someone from the webcast asking shareholders actually are losing the rights to the ownership of development. So can you, can you summarize what is good for shareholders in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term? I think that's a good way to end. Development business, uh, in the traditional sense, as uh, I mentioned just now, uh, it's long gestation requires uh, patient uh, capital. So the idea of this restructuring really is to match the capital to the rewards uh, uh, and the kind of uh, returns that the investors are seeking. So even though we are proposing this particular uh, restructuring exercise, it does not preclude or exclude the clean uh, platform for participating in development project by way of uh, raising a development fund and putting some equity and continue to gain exposure. Uh, through this particular arrangement, in fact, it gives uh, the uh, claim investors a lot more flexibility to choose the type of development projects that uh, the claim platform would like to participate, say, in the development of, uh, say, office buildings, 
uh, or uh, integrated developments or even logistics. So there are uh, uh, enough uh, flexibility for, clean, for the clean platform to participate, uh, but you know, not uh, having to, to be overly exposed you know, the balance sheet to huge uh, development projects, which uh, uh, may not be so appealing to uh, public uh, investors. Yeah. Thank you, Chico. So I think with that, we've come to the end of our Q&A uh, Q and our briefing today. Thank you all for taking time. Thank you to viewers online who are spending, uh, who spend the afternoon with us. I would like to ask Chi Kun or Andrew if you have any closing remarks before we conclude the session. Uh, nothing further, more that I can say, but just thank you. Uh, thank you for all the, all the trust and support uh, all these years. I, I, I know we have been, uh, uh, I mean, ever since we, we brought the uh, Sander Singh Bridge uh, deal to you, uh, we have been uh, very focused in terms of uh, uh, strengthening our capabilities and sharpening our focus. Uh, just want to reassure you that this proposed uh, restructuring is um, really one of positioning the company for future growth, creating two separate entities with um, support from different pots of uh, capital, different pots of uh, investors that will support the growth. Uh, just uh, thank you for, for the trust and I hope, you know, we, whether it's uh, investors, uh, the analysts, uh, to continue to support us in our transformation journey. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.